And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that, they, that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they knew they made known the saying that had been told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. Yeah, we 
Uh, you can be seated. Um, as you can tell, Scott is not sitting here this morning. Um, be praying for him and his family. He uh, actually tested positive on Friday morning, called me and said, you're up. So uh, he's feeling okay. He's, he's, he's doing okay. He said he was a little, little felt a little crummy yesterday, but, but he's doing good. Um, it is so good to have this guy back. Um, Got to hang out with him a little bit on, on Monday night. Um, we're, we're working on um, the, the, the Christmas Eve service that's coming up. We will not be here. Um, it will be completely online um, just because of all the stuff that's happening. We're trying to, to make that a little bit easier on everybody. But um, it was fun Monday night just getting to hang out and, and, and talk with Doug and sing with Doug and, um, and be here. So um, we just want to encourage you this morning. Um, I know this is the, the Christmas um, service kind of um, day, and it's, it's kind of weird not having our, our pastor here, but um, he called in the B team, so you're in for either a treat or a trick or something, I don't know, um, but we're going we're gonna to get through it, um, but I do want to rem- remind you about um, our Lottie Moon Christmas offering. Uh, we have, uh, church is always very gracious in giving to that, uh, which supports uh, missionaries on uh, in foreign countries, and um, there is a little video, we're going to pray real quick, and then we'll watch that video, uh, but, but continue to give to that. I also did want to say thank you. Um, from the staff uh, for the for the love offering that, that you guys have given to us um, is always a blessing. Um, I've I've been in places where there was there was very little um, given, and you guys are a church that gives, and you give out of the overflow of your heart. And we are grateful uh, to serve here. We're grateful uh, to be a part of this church family. So thank you for that. Let's let's pray together this morning. God, you are an amazing God. God, as we come before you on this this day to celebrate the birth of Jesus, God, I pray that you will let us forget everything else. God, that we won't come in here with any preconceived notions about what's going to happen today. But God, we will come in here fresh, ready to meet you. God, we pray that your Holy Spirit would fill this place, would fill our hearts. And God, that we would sing, not caring about anybody that's in the room. We would sing to you because you have been good to us. And God, I pray as as we open your word, God, that you would speak. God, you would hide me. It wouldn't be anything about what I wanted to say, but God, it would be your words. And God, I pray as we encounter you today, that we walk out of this room changed forever. God, you have the words of life. We pray that you would speak them over us today. Thank you for all that you do. I pray for Scott and his family, God, that you would keep them safe. God, for all of those who are dealing um, with, with the coronavirus right now, God, we pray that you would just continue to bring healing. And God, for those that, that we have lost, God, we're sorrowful. And God, we know they're in a place that is far better than here. And God, they would not want to come back here to this place because they are sitting at the perfect place at the feet of Jesus. So God, though we mourn, we rejoice also in their testimony that they have loved you and lived their life for you. God, I pray as we continue forward in your worship, God, that we would just let our hearts spill out because of all the things that you put into us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here in Thailand, there are so many people who don't know God, and no one they know knows God. Thai people have a desperate desire to get rid of the sin that they know they have. They're, they're going to the temples and they're taking money and gold and flowers and anything they can do that they think is good that might erase the sin that they know that is inside them. My calling to be a doctor and calling to be a missionary came on the same day. The missionary came and spoke at our church. He said the line, the saddest thing I've seen 
After 35 years on the mission field, his children sick and dying because there's no doctor to care for them. And it was a like a lightning bolt through my soul. And I said, okay, God, I'll be a medical missionary. Our ministry here takes mobile clinics all over the country of Thailand. Church planners call me up and say, I'm trying to start a new church or there's never been one, would you come and help me? Medicine is just a means for me to share the gospel with those who have no other access. When I talk about how to take care of their physical needs, it's just so easy for them to see when I start talking about their soul that they need a savior as well. And American churches have partnered with me in that. And they have sent me short-term mission teams that come with me for about a week every month. And we go out and do mobile clinics all over the country. Without the churches coming alongside me, I cannot do what I do. In general, people here do not like talking about spiritual things. But on mobile clinic, we can talk to 100 people in a day, 200 people, 300 people in a day that will come to mobile clinic and there we can share Christ with so many people at one time. It makes mobile clinic a great avenue for sharing the gospel. The point of mobile clinics is to start churches, groups of Thai believers that will go on to grow people in their new faith, to disciple them in their understanding of who Christ is, and to grow them together into groups that will become churches. There's a lot of things that money can't buy. Being able to be here and see God praise where he has never been praised before. That is a dear joy. Seeing souls saved in areas where no one has ever known God before. Watching them grow in their faith and lead others to faith. And watching them grow together into churches. Seeing churches start where no one has ever worshipped God before. Money can't buy that.
to uh, God just to come together online and in person God just to worship you and Lord I pray that we would never take never take this opportunity for granted as I'll discuss more in the coming weeks God all this can change in a matter of seconds so I pray 
as we come together each week, that it just won't be a, a just a meeting. God, we would come together. God, we would cry out to our Creator. God, we believe change, not anything that we can do, but by the power of you. And I pray there's one this holiday season that, that does not know you, that God, they would cry out and accept the best gift you could ever receive. Be with Jeremy today as he comes and he shares. I fill him with your spirit. God, I pray that we would leave changed today. You name we pray. Amen. This, this feels absolutely weird to me um, this morning. I, I was telling uh, Shane earlier that, you know, normally on Christmas, the Christmas service, you've you got a packed house. Um, the pastor is doing the best that he can do, and I feel like we're not giving you that today. Um, and it feels weird for me because I'm not ever that guy. So I've never really got to preach a Christmas message, so... Y'all get to be my guinea pigs this morning, um, so buckle up. We're gonna be we're gonna read a lot of scripture today, but before we do that, I just wanted to um, tell you a little story. I, I love Christmas. Okay, my Christmas um, growing up. My dad, as a pastor, he, he would listen to Christmas carols in the summer all the time. He loved Christmas carols. If we were going to do something like, when, when, back in the day when we'd have like Sunday night church and sometimes you'd have the, 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 the worship pastor who'd be up there and they would do like, hey, pick a hymn, right? You know, and they'd raise their hand. My dad, in the middle of the summer, was always like, Heart Carol Angels Sing or Silent Night. I mean, every time. I was like, man, everybody. Of course, I did the different thing. I would sing like, let's do the National Anthem or O Canada because that was in the thing. I was just wanting to mess with them a little bit. But we always sang Christmas carols. I loved it. Um, and I, and I, always, I always loved Christmas as a kid. Um, the anticipation of am I going to get what I want? You know, I ask for this, I, and, I, and I really want uh, that one thing. I remember probably about my seventh grade year, um, I was in the band. Um, that's, that's probably why I do some of the things, the things that I do, but I was, I was in a band, I played trumpet. And as a fifth grader, my mom bought me a trumpet. Uh, we didn't have a lot of money. My mom was a, a teacher, and my, my dad was a pastor, so we, didn't, we weren't rolling, you know, high um, down. So anyway... Um, it, it was it was a it was a gold trumpet. The bell was all jacked up because the person who had it before me had dropped it about fourteen times. Um, it was, it was about, about fifty, 50 bucks. bucks. Um, it, it, it came in a case, but the case wouldn't shut because the mouthpiece was shoved in it so far that you couldn't get it out. And the band director had tried everything. My dad had to heat it up with a torch and beat it out um, to get it out so I could close the case. It was a it was a not good trumpet. It played. It worked. Um, but I remember um, sitting there as a seventh grader and, and watching the high school band okay i, I love band. Band. My, my brother was in the band, band so i got to hang out with the band a lot and i remember watching the high school band and almost everybody in that band or at least all of the trumpet players that i looked up to that were incredible um players all had silver trumpets and i wanted a silver trumpet oh i wanted one so bad and i remember talking to my mom and dad like man i just i need one i need i need a silver trumpet this one i've got i mean it works but it's not very good and so i, I mean i built that up all year long you know i was i really wanted a silver trumpet really wanted a silver trumpet man christmas day we are open in presents, man. Wrapping papers, flying, right? And everybody has passed everything out, and we're sitting there, and I'm opening up presents, and that anticipation is killing me because I'm like, man, I, I'm going to get to that present, you know? And I, I start opening, and it, and it was kind of weird because it wasn't like I, I liked what I was getting, but there was some disappointment with every one I opened that wasn't the trumpet, you know? When you got a little box like that, you're like, oh, that's not it. So, but you, but I, I just remember that anticipation was killing me, and. And we got to the last box, and I opened up my present, and it wasn't a trumpet. And I remember just sitting there just kind of frustrated, you know. And, and, I, and I remember that anticipation was I was kind of feeling a letdown a little bit. And my, my mom and dad said, there's still a present under the tree. And it was, that was kind of a cool moment, and it had my name on it, right? 
And, and I remember that anticipation began to build in me. And, and, and we're all like that, right? Like, we're all, like, we, we love Christmas. We love the, the, the idea, idea of getting, getting and, and, you, you know, know when, 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 when you want something, something somebody's going to gonna give it to you. And, and we talk about, about Christmas, Christmas as being a season of giving and, and, and receiving. Because, um, like, let's be honest, if you didn't get anything for Christmas, um, it would not be fun, right? Guys, never make the mistake when your wife says, don't get me anything for Christmas to not get her anything for Christmas. Because she really wants something. She just wants you to. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you better get it, even if she doesn't get you anything. It's just the way it works, right? Um, and, and so, like, we all love that. We love to get some things. We love the anticipation of opening um, presents. You know, as we're young, um, we, we, it's all about what we get. When we get older, it's a little bit more about, you know, seeing the other people open what we've given them. Um, and it's kind of a, a neat situation, neat, neat moment um, for us as parents, for us as kids, just to be able to, to have this season of giving and receiving um, and the anticipation that comes with all of that, right? Not knowing what's about to happen. Um, and if you'll go with me to Scripture, I want to talk about a, a time in Scripture where anticipation was, was huge. And so we're going to look, um, we're going to read a lot today. I, I typically do this with my students. Um, so buckle up because I read fast and we're going to get through this. It, we're going to look at, at Luke chapter 1, verse 26 through 35. And then we're going to go over to Matthew 1, verse 18 through 25. So that'll be up there. But let's, let's go ahead and read this real quickly. It says this. Luke, it says, In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man named Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and the angel came to her and said, Rejoice, favored woman, the Lord is with you. But she was deeply troubled by this statement, wondering what kind of greeting this could be. Then the angel told her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Now listen. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Mary asked the angel, How can this be since I have not been intimate with a man? The angel replied to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. And if you look over at the Matthew um, section, this is, this is Gabriel. This is God revealing to, to Mary that she is going to have the Messiah. And if you look at the Matthew passage, verse, um, chapter 1, verse 18 says, The birth of Jesus came about this way. After his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, it was discovered before they came together that she was pregnant by the Holy Spirit. So her, the, her husband, Joseph, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her publicly, decided to divorce her secretly. But after he had considered these things, the angel of the Lord suddenly appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because what has been conceived in her is by the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Now all of this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. See, the virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they will... Name him Emmanuel, which is translated, God is with us. When Joseph got up from sleeping, he did as the, Lord, the Lord's angel had commanded him. He married her, but he did not know her intimately until she gave birth to a son, and he named him Jesus. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you for this, this season where we can celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. And God, I pray as, as, as we spend a few moments exploring your word, God, that you would speak. God, I pray that you would let us understand the necessity for the nativity this morning. That's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we have this passage, and, it, and, and we have these two instances. One, um, which we know is Gabriel, uh, according to Luke. We don't know what angel. We probably figure it was Gabriel in, in Matthew, uh, speaking to Joseph in a dream. Um, but we don't, we don't know. But what we understand in this is that, that, that if, we, if we look at the time period, there is great anticipation. All right? So um, we talk about the, the coming Messiah, and, and all the way through Scripture, we, we see that, that the need for the Messiah. And when we talk about, about anticipation, like we, when we want something, we, we anticipate it for a short period of time. Usually it's not usually a long, drawn-out thing. The people have been waiting for the Messiah for a very, very long time. When we talk about how long was that, we have to go all the way back to Genesis and understand that in Genesis chapter 3, the very worst human tragedy of all time took place in the Garden of Eden. When, when God had created man and gave, gave him everything, everything was at his disposal except there was one command, don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And we see that in, in, in Scripture, and we all understand. We look at Adam and Eve, and we go, why would you do that, right? But we would have done that, right? Because when mom says, don't eat the cookies, 
what do we want to do? We want to eat the cookies every single time. When mom says don't peek at the presents or don't go into that room because that's where the presents are kept, what do we find the kids doing? Trying to get in that room, right? They want to know. There's anticipation. And so what happened is, is in this, this moment, of, of God said, do not eat of that. They said, we're eating of that. I don't know what day it was. People have argued that. Was this day seven? Was this year two? If it was me, it was probably day one, about 30 minutes into it, because that's just what we do. We're sinful people, right? The difference here is that we have to understand that Adam was not like us. See, Adam was born, he wasn't born. That's a different thing. We were all born, so Adam is not like us. He was created by God, and God breathed the breath of life in him. And Adam was created without a sin nature, you understand that? He, he didn't have a sin nature in that moment, but he was tempted by the devil. His wife was tempted, and in that moment, they chose to defy God. And in that moment, we experienced tragedy. We are now separated for eternity from a holy God. It's a, it's a tragic moment. We are looking forward to a day when we can go to heaven and we can be with God. These people were, get, were able to be with God anytime they wanted in the garden. They could walk with the Lord. They could spend time in communion with the Lord. And yet they chose to break that. And, and, and ladies, let me, let, me, let, me, let me talk to you for a second. If a guy breaks up with you or he does something wrong, or do you, are you the one that's supposed to fix it? Or is he supposed to fix it? Better be him, right? If he messes up, he better fix it. He fixed the problem, right? You know what I'm talking about? You got to have a, have a guy break up with you or a girl break up with you, and you're like, I ain't getting back with them until they apologize. They fixed it. It's their fault. They messed up, and that's exactly what has to happen in Scripture. When we look at this, man broke the relationship between him and God because he was disobedient to God, and man must fix it. Look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 15 with me for a second. In this passage, we see uh, that God is speaking to the serpent. Here And he says this, he says, I will put hostility between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He will strike your heel and you, or he will strike, he will strike your head and you will strike his heel. In the NIV, it says he will crush your head. The offspring of Eve in this instance is going to have to fix the problem between God and man. And, and we see like all the way through from the moment that that was spoken, that prophecy was spoken, Eve and, and mankind began to look for the one who was going to break the curse. And so we, we have this anticipation of this Messiah. We have these prophecies all the way through the Old Testament of this Messiah that's going to come. And the problem that we have a lot of times when, when, when we, we look at this is the Messiah began to be this thing that, that everybody thought was going to be a king who set up on a high throne, who overthrew Rome, who established the, the kingdom of Israel back to what it once was. And that's not what God intended. God intended for the Messiah to fix the problem of sin between God and man. And we talk about the necessity of the, nat of the nativity. Why? Why did it have to happen this way? Why did it have to happen this way? Because the prophecy in, in Genesis 3.15 says this. It has to be a man that fixes the problem. And all the way through the Old Testament, we have men who do some good things, but they're sinful. They mess things up. And you look all the way through it. They're always looking for somebody. The Messiah has to be somebody who is like Moses, who's a prophet like Moses, who is greater than King David, who is, um, who is of the line of David, who is, of the line, is, is in the, the, the family of Judah. The scepter will not depart from that, that family. And you see all of these things, and it always becomes this kingly thing where, where everybody anticipates this great king who will come and who will overthrow the people who are, are um, oppressing the Israelites. And that is not exactly what God had in mind. So people begin to miss this whole thing. The reason that we have the nativity is important because when we look back at Luke chapter 1, verse 34, it says, it says this. Um, it says, Mary asked the angel, how can this be since I have not been intimate with a man? Um, the angel replied to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the Holy One to be born, born will be called the Son of God. God. So, so when we look at this, this remember, remember, Adam was created, right? right? He, he wasn't, wasn't born. born. So he was born, he was created without a sin nature. There has to be one who is 
born that is going to be a man but not have a sin nature so he could choose to not sin. Does that make sense? That can't happen unless God becomes man. We see the same thing happening in Matthew chapter 1, verse 20 and 21. It says this, After he had considered these things, the angel of the Lord suddenly appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife because what has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son. And you were to name him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. The whole idea in this that everybody in the Jewish culture missed is that man could not do this. They had tried for centuries and centuries to obey the law, to be good enough, to be able to get themselves right with God. And it would never, ever work. Because we don't have a choice. We are born with a sin nature. We will sin before we will be right. It's just what we do. It's what we're born into. And there had to be one that was born again without a sin nature. The Bible calls Jesus the second Adam, the one who was born without a sin nature. And Jesus, being fully human, chose not to sin. How did he do that? I've had all kinds of people ask me that question. There's a a Bible study that that I I take students through, and and, and we're we're looking at the whole idea of the full humanity of Jesus in this. Did he, was he fully human? Was he fully fully God? How did all of that work? How does that that math problem work? I'm not good at math. I was an English guy, so math doesn't work, but 100% and 100% seems to be 200% and it doesn't work, right? But The The whole whole idea idea of this is that in Jesus' full full humanity, humanity, he chose chose to to not sin. sin. Being fully human, he did not use his abilities as God is what Philippians tells us, that he emptied himself and he did not use his abilities as the deity to do anything that he did on earth. He allowed the Holy Spirit to empower him. He studied the word of God. He used that in temptation against Satan to to take him to the word of God to do what he was supposed to do. And because God's plan in Genesis 3.15 was for the son of Adam, Eve, to be the one who crushed the head of the serpent, we had to have a perfect person. And the only way that was possible was if God became that person. That's why it's necessary for this nativity to act and to happen exactly the way it did. It couldn't just be another person that was good. That wouldn't ever work. It would never work because we can never, ever be good enough. The whole idea here, and you see this in the Matthew passage where he says, um, he says, um, is Matthew, yep. No, Luke. No, Matthew. Right there, verse 23. Yeah. It says, see, the virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they will name him Emmanuel, which is translated, God is with us. This is not the first time people had heard this passage. It wasn't the first time this passage is in Scripture. This passage is in Scripture in Isaiah 7, chapter 7, verse 14. It says this, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive... Have a son and name him Emmanuel. So why is it that the Jewish people miss this whole idea? It's because this prophecy at the time had nothing to do with the Messiah. Some of y'all looking at me like, what did you just say? But this prophecy actually had to do with King Ahaz, who was upset and afraid that the king of Syria, who had partnered with the king of Israel to overthrow him, was going to come in and wipe him out and put somebody else on the throne. And he was scared and he was afraid. And God said, ask me for a sign. And he said, no, I'm not going to tempt you. I'm not going to test you, God. God said, well, listen, I'm going to give you a sign. Here's the sign. The virgin will conceive, give birth to a son, and she will name him Emmanuel, which is literally translated, God is with us, as a sign. And it says this, later, that child will grow up, and he will, he will be weaned before, when, once he, before he is weaned, that, that whole alliance from the northern tribes will be put out, and it won't happen anymore, right? They were never looking for the Messiah in that passage, the Old Testament. They weren't looking for that. It wasn't until Matthew, until God revealed that to Matthew, that that was not just a historical prophecy, but that was one of the Messiah that was to come, that he put those two together and said, look, here it is. God has to come and be born to be with us so that he can die and save us from our sins. That's the only way this thing is going to work. The reason for the nativity, the necessity of the nativity is so important because it's this. The necessity for the nativity is this. God became human to restore humanity's relationship with God. It's the only way the prophecy from Genesis 3.15 can be fulfilled. The offspring of man 
that can crush the head of the serpent, that is pure enough to be the Lamb of God, which we see John the Baptist call him the Lamb of God, is if God becomes man. It's the only way possible. And he does that to restore a right relationship between man, between humanity, and with God. And we sometimes, we look at Christmas, and we're so excited about this little baby in a manger, and, and, and it is just so important. It is so important. And we get, we get so excited about the gift-giving and, and all the things, and we forget what Jesus had to do. He had to step off of his throne where he had all glory all the time. He was right there with the Father, seated at his right hand. And at any moment, he could ask and he could do anything he wanted to do. And he had to stop all of that, step off that throne and come and live the same type of life that we have to live. But he didn't come to be served. He came to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. He was obedient to death, even death on the cross. It wasn't a happy existence for the king of all kings to stop being the king and to come and serve everybody else. It's not, it's not a glamorous life. Jesus didn't, wasn't born in a palace. He wasn't born like everybody thought the Messiah would be born. He was born in a dirty stable. He was born that way because God wanted us to understand that we can't do it by ourselves. He has. We have to rely on him. He had to come and do this. The problem very, very early began with a man that had no sin nature choosing to sin. The problem is solved only when a man with no sin nature chooses to be obedient to the Father. As we have, um, in, in all the way through John, if you read John's Gospels, if you read John's Gospel and you read the, the, the letters that John wrote, you see something very, um, very important that comes up. All the time, John is saying this, this. He said, if you love me, you will obey me. I tell my kids all the time, the way that you can show that you love me is if you're obedient to me. Right? When I ask my kids to do something and they just get up and do it, it shows me that they respect me, that they love me. The same is, is true with us and God. That's why Jesus, did, everything Jesus did pointed back to the Father. Everything Jesus did gave glory to the Father in everything that he did because he was being obedient because he loved his Father. That's what we need to be doing with our lives. And when, when we, we talk about this, this anticipation, the anticipation of the whole world was for this Messiah to come and they missed it because they were looking at something completely. They had their idea of what it was really going to be and they missed the fact that God would become man. What was the big thing that they, 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 they said they accused Jesus of? It was blasphemy. Claiming to be God. They missed it. They completely missed it. Because the whole time they thought, we're going to have a king show up. He's going to gain power and overthrow everybody else. And they missed the fact that God would come to be a carpenter's son. That he would grow up not having honor in his own home, in his own hometown. He would grow up being run out of places. He would grow up learning what suffering really is. And he would suffer the ultimate humiliation of being put on a cross as a spectacle for everybody to make fun of. To prove that Rome was in charge. But in doing that, he broke the sin, the curse of sin and death and hell for us. And in that moment, he restored humanity's ability to be with God. That's why the nativity is so important. That's why this moment of Christmas is so important. And I pray that we don't miss it this year. I pray that we understand this. Because when we talk about the anticipation that everybody was waiting for and waiting for and waiting for, they, the people who understand it got it. And their, their, their excitement and their anticipation was fulfilled in the birth of Jesus Christ. They had waited. If you read just a little bit before this, you see that Zechariah, that you see that... Um, that, that there were two, um, in, 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 I believe it's in Luke, where we see that, that they had waited for the Messiah. And God told them they won't die until the Messiah. They see the Messiah, and the Messiah has come, and they were ready to go. They were ready to die. Here's the thing. They saw, the, they had the anticipation, and their anticipation was fulfilled in the, the, the announcement and the birth of Jesus Christ. It's such an important thing in, in, in Scripture when we understand that. Now, the, the, we talked about anticipation, right? Gift giving, right? We love to give gifts, 
right? And as a kid, remember, as a kid, it's all about getting. It's all about what we get, what we get. What, what, what is mom and dad going to give us? And we are so excited about it and open up those presents and we see those things. My, my nephew, I love him dearly. Man, when he was a kid, um, when he was little, he would get, it didn't matter what he got. If he got underwear, he's like, woohoo, I got underwear. I mean, he was so excited. He was, he was throwing stuff around. He loved it. Socks, yes. You know, he was excited about it. Some of us are not so excited about getting underwear and socks, right? It's, you know, I mean, it's like, wow, thanks, right? It's like that, that tie you get on Father's Day sometimes. You know, it's like, woo. It lights up. That's fun. I'm never going to wear that. Um, but here's the deal. We, we have anticipation, and we get so excited about things. But as parents, the excitement changes. Dads, you're excited to see what your kids got for Christmas, too, um, because mom bought it all, right? I mean, it's the way it is. We're like, ooh, that was cool. I want one of those. Um, but, no, we, we get excited about watching our children open a gift, that maybe they have waited for, that they've longed for, they've, they've hoped for for a while. And we get excited to see their face when they open up that package. Unless it's not what we wanted, right? Um, there you go. <laughs> but here's the deal. I think part of that's just maturity. When we grow up, we learn to, it's, it's more about giving than it is receiving. When we've received the gift of the Holy Spirit, when we've received Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior... Something ought to switch in us. As we mature, it should be less about what we have received and more about how we give it. It needs to be more about how we take this gift and we give it to someone else. Because see, in the same way that, that Adam, Adam that, that, that he was created and God breathed the breath of life into him, one of the coolest moments that we can ever experience. Patrick and I talk about this all the time. We go to Falls Creek and we get the opportunity to share the gospel with a student. And they, they get to that, that moment when they say, yes, I want to receive Christ. And they begin to pray and ask God to forgive them of their sins. They repent and they ask God to be the Lord of their life and to save them in that moment. When they say amen, the next breath is almost if the Holy Spirit just boom, right in there. And it is the coolest thing to see them have new life on that first breath. That is that, that's that moment of anticipation in me that I'm so excited to see them open up that present and they are so excited to receive that gift of the Holy Spirit. We are so excited about gift giving this, this, this season, during, during this season, but what about the ultimate gift? How often are we, we willing to go out and give the gift of life to people, to share with them what God has given to us? As I opened up that last package, my joy was complete because there sat that silver trumpet. I was so excited about that. Grady was waiting to hear the end of that story. What Grady? He was like, I gotta know what the end of that story is. Here's the deal. I, I, I received that trumpet, and man, it, it 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 made my Christmas. It made my day. I was able to take the old and put it away. And take this new, new to me. Um, trumpet that, that, that I felt like was going to, to change the way I played, to change the way I was looked at, change the way that, that everything happened with me in band. It didn't. But here's the deal. When we understand the gift of Jesus and what that does for us, it takes the old away and brings the new and it changes everything. My question is this. Have you ever given your life to Christ? Some of you, I, here's the deal. I don't know anybody. I don't assume anything about anybody. Okay, I have been in churches where an 80-year-old guy who was a Sunday school teacher for 40 years walked an aisle on a Sunday morning and said, I thought I was saved and I'm not. And he gave his life to Christ. I've been in, in places where, 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 where youth pastors or, or pastors have realized that they were lost and gave their life to Christ. I assume nothing about anybody. Okay, my students know that. I don't assume that they are saved. I, a lot of people have been through a baptistry. A lot of people have been to an altar. A lot of people have gone down at False Creek and, and prayed a prayer and, and talked to somebody and did all kinds of things. But I don't know if they really have a relationship with Christ. I think if we do, it bears out in how we act and how we live our life. I think we can see that in some people. But here's the deal. If you've never received the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ, today might be your day. What a better day. What a better day to receive that gift that takes the old away and brings the new. In this season right now of, of the coronavirus, what better gift can we give to other people than to share with them the one thing that changes everything? And you know who that's put on? 
That's the church. That's our responsibility. That's what God has called us to do. To go and make disciples, to go and share with people this message of how God didn't come to sit on a throne. He came to die for us. That how God came to fix the problem. We don't have to be good enough. Praise the Lord. He did it for us. And all we have to do is say thank you and receive the gift. And if you haven't done it today, we're about to, we're about to have an invitation and we're going to pray. And if God is dealing with your heart about that, if God is convicting you of sin and showing you that you need a Savior, this morning, say yes to him. But church, that, this message is not just about receiving Christ. It's about giving him as well. Are you willing this year to not just give gifts to people that we bought with some money or we built with our own hands. Are you willing to give the gift that God has given you? You see, some of us are going to be around family this year and we have a family member that we don't know if they know Jesus or not. One thing that I've heard from, from several people in this whole time is, man, I wish I'd have had more time to tell somebody. I wish I'd have had more time to spend with that person. And people are, 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 are losing battles right now with their life. They're losing battles with, with the coronavirus. Um, and it's, it's one of those things that you don't know. You don't know what's about to happen. But you have the gift of life. Let's not be selfish this Christmas time. Let's give that. Whether they receive it or not, let's give it to them. Let's tell them what Jesus did for us and how they can experience salvation in him as well. Let's pray together. God, we thank you. We thank you that you gave. You gave yourself for us. God, we are completely undeserving of that. But God, you took the anticipation of a coming Messiah. And it all built up to one moment when you, you became man. You became man because we could not live up to the standard of sinlessness that we needed to to fix the problem between us and you. And God, you knew from the very moment that we broke that relationship that you would have to be the one who came to fix it. And God, we are so grateful that you did. And God, I pray if there's anyone sitting here today or at home that is watching this, God, that they don't know 100% if they have given their life to Christ, that they have salvation in you. God, I pray today that you would begin to convict their heart of the sin in their life and they would repent and say yes to you in salvation. God, I pray for us as a church, for those who have believed and given their life for you, their life to you. God, I pray that you would convict us of our sin of laziness and apathy when it comes to being the follower of Christ that we're supposed to be. God, it was so necessary for you to make the nativity be exactly what it was, to give us this ultimate gift of salvation through you, that we need to give that to others. And God, I pray that you would empower the people in this congregation to go and share the gospel as much as possible. Because God, this world that we live in is broken and desperately needs you. And God, we have the remedy. Give us the boldness to use it. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You stand with us. If God's dealing with your heart about something, maybe it's Maybe it's not that you need to give your life to Christ. Maybe it is. Uh, maybe it's that you just need to start your relationship anew with Christ. Maybe you need to just kind of have a do-over. You don't have to come talk to me. Come hit the altar. Come get before God. Maybe it is that, that you, God has laid somebody on your heart that you need to share with. Man, come hit the altar this morning. Get on your face before God and ask God to give you that opportunity to share life with Him.
Um, just a couple of announcements. Uh, Scott wanted me to m- make sure to mention the the um, Lottie Moon Christmas offering again. Um, that's um, it's such a huge offering. It blesses so many people. Um, helps us to further the, 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 the gospel across the globe. Um, Christmas Eve service is um, begins six o'clock. It'll be on Facebook, YouTube, and the church website on the live stream page. It's not. We're not going to be here. Um, we have already recorded it. So if you come here, you if it, you're not going to see anything because nobody's going to be here. We're going to do it online. So, um, so tune in with us on on that. Um, Continue to pray for those that are being affected by, by coronavirus, the Watkins family. Um, I know this is not the way they wanted to spend their um, Christmas vacation as to being at home uh, the whole time. So uh, be praying for them. Be praying um, for us. Today, if you haven't, I don't know where they, they just, she just left. Do you know what's happening with the boxes? Okay. There are still more boxes, uh, more food boxes that we're delivering to families in, in need in our community. Um, so when we're done, go hit the gathering and see if you can help take some. They, they, have, they have addresses on them um, that you can take and go deliver it to a family that desperately needs um, some help during this Christmas season. Okay. Um, it's an awesome way for us to just to have an opportunity. You don't even have to. I mean, I would knock on the door because you don't want to leave food on the front porch without them knowing. But but if even if they're not there, leave it there. Uh, we don't have to get close. You don't have to go in and, and, and talk to them. Uh, but you can just take a moment maybe to pray for for them at the door um, through this time, okay? Um, let's see, is there anything else? No? Offering. Offering boxes. Somebody else, Carl will hit me if I don't say something about the offering boxes. Uh, offering boxes are around. Just drop it in there. Um, there's not, not any church um, activities on Wednesday. Uh, this Wednesday, I don't believe next Wednesday either. Um, so 